Okay. Thank you very much again for joining us this, uh, today um, for our panel on, um, on VOD. Uh, it's certainly not the first panel uh, about this topic, um, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a thing that, that in all of, which is in all of our minds, um, there are constant changes. There have been some, some major leaps, uh, leaps over the past uh, 12 months. And so I'm very glad that we uh, that the festival was able to to gather that great group of uh, all stars, as Andrew said, uh, just to go into the details, go a little bit further into the details of the VOD and understanding about this new landscape which is all around us. And um, we have here Jonathan Searing with IFC Films, right? That's correct. Good. <laughs> Winnie Lau from Fratissimo, um, Edward Burns actor, producer, director, filmmaker, you might all know. Um, Tom Quinn with Radius, the Weinstein Company, recently set up company and had their first successful release only a few weeks ago. And Philip Nashville, head of uh, Curse and Artificial Life from the UK. Um, I would ask you just to, just to briefly introduce yourself um, to give us a quick overview, you know, what you're, what you're doing, what your companies are doing, and your, your connection with VOD. Maybe we can start with you, Jonathan. Connection with VOD. Uh, let's see. Jonathan Searing, IFC Films. We have three distribution labels, a genre label called IFC Midnight, a prestige theatrical label called Sundance Selects, because we're partners with the Sundance Institute, and a, another label called IFC Films, which is sort of bigger, uh, uh, broader motion pictures. We had previously been known by a cable operator, so we've been very much you know, thinking about VOD and working in the VOD space you know, well before, I'm not gonna say well before it was fashionable, but well before it was economical as well. Um, but that was something that our parent company had driven us to really think about and alter a distribution strategy in January of, I think, 2006. We had done our first day and date theatrical and VOD release. We've probably released somewhere between 400 and 500 movies, either day and date theatrical VOD, straight to VOD, a common, uh, pre-theatrical on VOD. So we've been in, experimenting and operating in that space for quite some time. We still do some traditional theatrical distribution. We've done recently Werner Herzog's Cave of Forgotten Dreams in 3D, uh, Vim Vendor's Pina Bausch, uh, a documentary. So those we didn't do uh, on VOD, those we did traditionally. But we, a lot of experience, a lot of different ways that we've done it. And as Ed and I were talking before, it just keeps changing. I don't think there's one right way, one answer for any movie. I think it's different for every film, so. I uh, completely agree with Jonathan on that. Um, I'm Winnie, I work with Fortissimo Films. We are an international sales company over 20 years, working with international filmmakers from around the world. And um, our connection to a VOD is that it's an extension of actually how you approach each and every film for each and every territory in a different way. And we are, because we work with international filmmakers around the world, we know how challenging and how tough it sometimes can be to find the standard distribution model for each and every film. And to that degree, we are not strangers to being creative in terms of finding the right solution and finding the right distribution structure for each and every film. Um, recently, we've just done a direct um, licensing deal with Netflix for catalog libraries um, for the USA. And that's our venture into um, the VOD platform. At this moment, we, have, we are thinking about further platforms, not just for the US, but also for the rest of the world, because um, the world is different. The world is quite big, quite large, and there are a lot of different ways to show and have the films be seen by the audience now with this modern technology. Uh, I'm Ed Burns. I'm a filmmaker. Uh, my connection to VOD um, came about probably just by trying to stay in business and figure out a way to make money making movies. Um, I'll give you. A, I'll try and abbreviate a long-winded answer. But what I had discovered about halfway through my career was traditionally, you know, your specialized film would open up, um, you know, a platform release, New York and LA, and then go out, you know, several weeks. Uh, roll out over the over the country, 
Um, what would happen was, you know, me and my cast would do a ton of press leading up to that New York, L.A. release, and maybe back in the mid-'90s, by the time that movie got to Cleveland four weeks later, uh, the audience remembered seeing you on Conan. Uh, but what started to happen was, as, you know, uh, there was a lot more uh, things being thrown at the audience, they forgot about the title of your movie. Uh, and I would hear from people as I went around to film festivals, hey, whatever happened to that movie? Why didn't it ever come to my town? I ended up having to check it out on DVD or I caught it on HBO. So we knew that the audience was there, but the problem was at our moment of our highest, let's say, cultural awareness, um, they couldn't access the film. So in 07, we decided to try something different, and we were the first film uh, to offer a film exclusively on iTunes, thinking, all right, a lot of people have iTunes, uh, I can do a bunch of publicity, and they can access the film in their living room. And we had a lot of success with that film, uh, and then we started to notice that companies like IFC and Magnolia were doing sort of a day-and-date VOD thing. So uh, I had a film a couple of years ago, Nice Guy Johnny, and... We had an offer, you know, a uh, uh, no advance partnership to do another sort of traditional specialized release. And my lawyer, uh, John Sloss, uh, said, you know, we should maybe think about VOD. And the argument he gave to me was, here's the difference. When you're going to do that weekend of publicity and you have your big push, you can access the, you know, uh, the couple of thousand folks in New York and L.A., or we can go into 45 million homes. And the minute I heard that, I said, you know what, let's, let's go for this. And decided when we did our press not to make any apologies for it, to say, hey, this is the future. We know where the audience is. They're home in their living rooms. They've been watching great uh, sort of uh, like, uh, you know, indie type of um, uh, programming via HBO and AMC and Showtime, and that's our audience. And they're sitting on their couches in front of their flat screens and that's where they are. So we said, let's go to them. Let's not ask them to come to the theater. And especially because so many of the art house theaters have closed down. Um, so we did that, and we had great success with that. We did it again last year with uh, Tribeca. Um, so I'm a big believer, obviously, in, in VOD being, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a, a lifesaver, but it's certainly a safety net for, for um, indie film. Uh, good morning. I'm Tom Quinn. Uh, I, I noticed when you introduced Ed, you, you also didn't say he's one of my favorite distributors. Uh, he's done a fantastic job with his last two movies, and uh, we can learn a lot from each other. Uh, I couldn't agree with more with Jonathan and Winnie as well. Um, my sort of background, I've been in the industry for 16 years. Uh, I worked for Samuel Goldwyn, which is one of the most traditional, I think the oldest distributor in the world, uh, very traditional theatrical distributor. And then I had the good fortune of going to work for Mark Cuban and Todd Wagner at Magnolia and the 2929 Empire, which also included the landmark theaters. And, you know, to Mark Cuban's credit, sort of had the vision of building an entire company about making films available to consumers when they want. And I think his analogy was, well, I own a basketball team. Uh, you know, there are people who can come see it live. There are people who can listen to it on the radio. There are people who can watch it at home on TV, and there are also people who can buy the entire season on DVD if they like. And I think adapting that philosophy to film was kind of genius. Uh, our first attempt at doing that was a film called Bubble, uh, which is not the first day and date movie. Red Rock West is the f sort of first accidental day and date movie uh, theatrically released post Showtime, but I believe that was really the first day and date movie of its kind. And the model then was well, let's launch a DVD simultaneously with the theatrical release. And it was sort of a ham-fisted model because it was trying to solicit retailers to take a DVD and, uh, for a film that had never been released theatrically. So it was just sort of a very ham-fisted way to do this incredible idea. And on that movie, we noticed one of the most interesting things about it was the hotel VOD numbers were through the roof. And so I think that sparked the idea, which Jonathan, who ultimately did it first on a movie called Kill the Poor, um, a couple of years later, uh, you know, that spawned all of this. And, you know, I have subsequently left Magnolia, uh, love them dearly, uh, left behind my favorite label in the world, something I created called Magnet, incredible genre label, uh, and started a, a boutique label for Harvey and Bob, I would say the godfathers of distribution at large. And uh, we thought, what if we could take all the things that we learned at Goldwyn from IFC, from Ed Burns uh, and Mark and Todd, and let's do it with Harvey and Bob. And 
we called it Radius. Uh, we spent 12 months prepping, meeting all the VOD providers, exhibitors, DVD distributors, and how could we sort of refine this model? And, and not only sort of, as Jonathan said, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but let's push it even farther. And so uh, we just launched our first movie, and it's a movie called Bachelorette that we bought at Sundance. Uh, we spent uh, three months recutting it with the director, Leslie Headland, and the beauty of that was right out of the gate, the movie went to number one on iTunes has been in the top 10 charts on all VOD, and we just opened it theatrically this weekend where it's uh, you know, outpacing other traditional wide releases, I'd say wide releases in the special specialized arena, like For a Good Time Call, the same demo, we've done about 200,000 bucks this weekend. So, uh, sorry, I'm a little long-winded here, but we're about to do 18 films a year, uh, and uh, really excited about our first movie, and uh, anyway. Thanks. It's really interesting for me sitting here from over the pond, the other side of the world. I come from London, Philip Natchbull, and I run a company called Curzon Artificial Eye. For those of you who don't know, Curzon Cinemas is a kind of chain of independent cinemas in the UK. Artificial Film Releasing is a 35-year-old film distribution company that uh, has a reputation of distributing some of the best indie and specialised art house movies in the UK. And since 2007, we've been realizing there's a change in the marketplace, and we've uh, started releasing films day and day in 2007 uh, with a company called Sky, B Sky B, it's Rupert Murdoch's uh, subsidiary of Fox or News International. And we signed a deal with them to, to co buy and co release five feature films a year. And the reason I did that is because. Um, in looking at what happened to the music industry and how badly they got it wrong, we absolutely needed to confront the issue that the consumer is in control and the consumer decides what uh, they want to consume and where they want to consume. And piracy is a major issue that everyone is aware of. And to get around that, we just do not believe in the idea of Windows. But having said that, I don't really believe in the term video on demand or VOD. It's a horrible term. It's a horrible terminology. What, in fact, our, our Curzon on demand service, which is a pioneering service, um, the day and date releasing, the only one in the UK that's connected directly to a, a, a cinema chain. Uh, I'm going to drop the name on demand, and we're just going to call it Home Cinema. Curzon Home Cinema and Curzon Public Cinema. And the two are synonymous. They're exactly the same. It doesn't mean anything different. It's just how you consume a film is what is different. One is you go to you know, a larger hall with a, a bigger venue and it's public, and you have that shared emotional experience. The other one is you put it on your... Uh, Samsung 52-inch television with your 5.1 home cinema system and you have your girlfriend or your boyfriend whatever and you sit there and you enjoy the same film in incredible quality. So I like to think really now we're the largest uh, cinema exhibitor in the world. We've got access to 26 million cinema screens. Effectively, home cinema screens. And what I also believe is that, that, that you know, the online experience is a very soulless experience. And so to, people talk about social networking. I think it's really important to connect it back up to the public venues, which are really the shop windows, and to have that public social networking connected back to the home social networking and how we market and, and sell our movies. So uh, that's my introduction. That's me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much so far. You see, our, our panelists up here pretty much cover every every field of uh, film and film distribution. Though I want to go back to the, to the very beginning of the chain. Uh, chain. At, um, you released your, your films um, Purple Violets and Nice Guy Johnny solely through VOD. And your, your latest one, uh, The Fitzgerald Family Christmas, you go back to theatrical again to a certain degree. Uh, well, we're not really going back to theatrical. The film, we, we just sold the film to Tribeca Films and we'll have a uh, a, a digital release on November 20th, which will include iTunes um, and, and VOD. Uh, we're going to, and for a long time, I, I've been saying that, you know, the, the, the idea of the theatrical release for these smaller movies just doesn't seem to make sense. I understand that, you know, uh, in order to get reviewed by, you know, the, the major critics and, and the, the New York Times, you need to have a theatrical. Uh, you need to have a theatrical release. But what we discovered with these films is by using social media and speaking to, you know, uh, the fan base via Twitter and Facebook, um, and uh, forging relationships with all those online critics, uh, we've been using them, and we're able to reach a pretty wide audience. 
The other thing is we just we, we looked at all the numbers. Even if we were to do like a one screen release in New York or have a decent sized fan base, you know, best case scenario, we were going to break even. Um, and given that we make these films at lower budgets and we just looked at it and said, why put ourselves in a half a million dollar hole or a million dollar hole in order to try and gamble on that theatrical? Um, if, we can, if we can access that large audience on VOD um, and spend no money marketing the film and just use traditional publicity and uh, just go crazy on social media, what would that outcome be? And on Nice Guy Johnny, we spent not a single cent marketing the film and you know, we got into the top 25 on iTunes rental and in two days by just tweeting um, out to my followers, I was able to get up to number six. Uh, that's you know, and, and the only other film was Winter's Bone in the top twenty-five. It was an indie film. And that's you know, I think it was Searchlight, and that's a ton of money behind that movie. So that that spoke to the power of sort of this new world order and how you can communicate with your fans. So with this new film, we may do a uh, you know a one-week release in New York around Christmas time because it is a Christmas film, um, but we still haven't decided if we want to do that yet. We're sort of going to look at. Um, uh, kind of how we're doing uh, on VOD and then sort of make the call. Given that it's, you know, it's a one or two screen release, um, we can make that decision. We don't have to make that decision today. Okay, but that means with that theatrical uh, measure, you get a little bit more kind of profile, which wouldn't be possible that way through, through VOD. I think that's pretty much the thing, that you need to create your profile online when you don't have a theatrical release, right? Well, I mean, I'm lucky enough that, you know, I mean, uh, and I know when I, you know, I go to the film schools and talk to kids who sort of want to do the same thing, I, I have the benefit of being in the business for 17 years and having Fox Searchlight and Paramount Classics and their marketing dollars sort of help me become famous, I guess. Uh, so I can get myself onto the Today Show and onto Jimmy Fallon. So, you know, that, that while that review in the Times or in the mainstream publications well, does help, we're able to get enough of regular mainstream press that those films have a high enough profile to compete with the focuses and the searchlights, uh, at least in the digital landscape. Okay. Well, Philip, I guess you have a slightly different approach. Yeah, I you do. I think your aim is not taking theatrical out of the uh, revenue chain completely. I, I, I think it's totally unnecessary to exclude theatrical. I mean, people ask me, the big operator, the big multiplex operators in the UK, they see me as their enemy. But they also say to me, why are you killing your own business? You're a theater owner. Why on earth would you, would you release films simultaneously and dry up an already difficult? What I, I mean, my, my company's slightly different in that we're very independent. We, show, we don't show any Hollywood movies really at all in our cinemas, apart from The Dark Knight and you know, a few other great movies like that. But I think the essence... Uh, how's that in... Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. How are they, you know, but, aside from The Dark Knight? Yeah. No, what I'm saying is we, we basically... Sh the films we distribute are really indie films, and we are, the multiplexes do not like our, 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 our films. Our customers don't really like going to the multiplexes, plus we now have to pay a, a, a VPF every time we, we, we book one of our films into, a, into a, a Cineworld or an Odeon or a View, plus we only get 25% film rental. So what, where I do agree with that in, in terms of the, the high cost of marketing, but what we were able to do before we, we launched Curzon Home Cinema and we were working with Sky Box Office is their 26 million customers um, who, who pay whatever it is, $200 a month up to, to, to watch all their sports and films, they, they were able to take our movies, cut a trailer, their own trailer, cross-market that across Sky News, Sky One, Sky Box Office, whatever, saying in cinemas on Sky Box Office, watch this movie. And the effect that that had is A, it communicated to a lot of people that these sort of films were in cinemas and they didn't even realize they were in cinemas and had a choice to go and see them in the cinemas. And secondly, it meant that we didn't have to spend maybe three, four, five hundred thousand pounds, uh, whatever dollars that is, I don't know, uh, you know, on P&A. And, 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 and so we learned that basically there is a, a much larger audience out there that have grown up on, on, on VHS and DVD and now parroting on, on, online movies. But actually, they do want to go to the cinema. They do want the theatrical experience. And there's nothing inconsistent in giving the consumer a choice about that. So what we're seeing is now we're releasing films 
we're, we released a French film called La Havre uh, last month. We expected like a three hundred thousand uh, pound box office. We did, we, uh, sorry, one hundred and fifty thousand pound box office. We did nearly four hundred thousand. We're going to release this Kylie Minogue French film, Holy Motors, uh, on September the eighteenth. Uh, on uh, you know, we, we, we're just launching with Samsung Television on, t on, on uh, a Curzon Home Cinema app on two two million Samsung connected TVs. And we, you know, we expect that the cinema box office, part of that, the public cinema box office, as opposed to the home cinema box office, will be more than it otherwise would have been. So I'm incredibly optimistic about this, and I don't think we should write off the actual talk. Well, so, but Lahav, though, is that also available on Curzon yes, Cinema? Yes, day and day. And, and how's it doing comparatively? Comparatively, <laughs> you're like, I get asked this by the journalists all the time. I mean, you mean in terms of numbers? But well, I, I would assume that the real upside for Lahav really is the theatrical dollar. No, not at all. The upside for Lahav is, is, is still the home entertainment, the TV sale, the pay TV sale, the pay one, the pay two with Netflix, or whatever. That's the upside. I'm, you see, we're talking a different language here. I'm saying there is, there is still a window, if you like, between um, theatrical and, and the other revenue streams. But I'm saying that home theatrical is no different than the public theatrical. I would agree. I mean, we have a theater as well. We launch anything we do theatrically day and day. We have our own cinema. And it's funny because Tom had mentioned uh, Todd Wagner. Todd, when we were building this theater, and it's almost, I'm going to say, 2000. 2005, we weren't going to do this till we had our cinema complete. And Todd, Todd was saying, Go DVD. And I'm like, No, we want to go VOD day and day. And I took him on a tour of the theater. But, you know, he was, he was, you know, Todd was like, He came to meet with me, say, You guys have a distribution company, go day and date. You've got to change the model. And, and we could not figure out how to make traditional theatrical distribution work. And you're talking about a company that released My Big Fat Greek Wedding, which is either the biggest or second biggest indie of all time. And we did Itu Mama Tambien, which was one of the most successful foreign language films. But it's so goddamn hard because you didn't know where to spend p and so you spent it everywhere. And like, like Ed said, it, the, the amount of p and you would spend never made sense because the internet is at the place to be. Newspapers, people aren't reading them, but theater owners want you in newspapers, magazines, television. So we just ran our P&A up so much that we were either going to fold or change, and that's why we went to the, the VOD day and date model. But, you know, Tom, you're asking, like, La Havre, like a movie like four months, three weeks, two days for us, or Gamora, uh, when we did that day and date, they all did as well, if not better, on VOD than they did theatrically. And both of those were between one and a half and two million dollar grosses at the box office. And, you know, we've done straight to VOD. It really all depends on the movie. Ed, Eddie's so successful at it because he's a brand and he's got, a, you know, he's a filmmaker that people want to follow. And you're in a really unique position uh, compared to most independent filmmakers. And I, one of the things I think we were going to talk about is like, how do I get my movie in position? It's really hard if you're an independent filmmaker and you want to put your movie up there and get it out. It's less hard for Ed because he's, you know, made one of the most, you know, a, a landmark independent film, and people follow him, and he's, you know, continues to be a great filmmaker, and he's doing this on his own, and, you know, hats off to him. It's hard, uh, and I, but I agree with Philip. I think uh, theatrical is really still a very critical part of it. Let, let's turn it the other way around, since you, since you have such a vast experience uh, on VOD, considering when you stepped into the landscape and the number of films you did. Um, after, after a few years now, do you think there is, there is a place for every film on VOD? No. No. I mean, uh, what, what has become great about it, but also terrible about it, it's now almost this vast wasteland. And unless you're a brand... And, or unless you spend marketing dollars, you, I, I got to tell you, you're so unique because you have to market a movie. You have to put it in theaters. You have to get people writing about it. You have to get people blogging about it. You've got to spend some money. I mean, Tom was able to get uh, an, an incredible cast out to, you know, pound the drum for Bachelorette. Uh, that is so critical. Eddie goes on, you know, morning shows. That's so, so critical. And, and 
of the of the entire industry, the the people who are way behind on this, and I mean way behind, are the talent managers for actors and actresses. They just don't get it. It's where the money's coming from. It's the future of cinema. Steven Soderbergh's like, I'm there. Eddie's, I'm there. But talent managers for actors and actresses. And the sales agent. And the sales agent. Right. They don't get I, I it. Think Not we're, quite. We're very much at it. Not quite. Excuse me. Gotta <laughs> but I, I remember this summer seeing you on a panel saying that very thing. It's still and a problem. A month later, Bachelorette is being written about as the number one film yeah. on iTunes. So I believe that Hollywood traditionally, sorry, I'm waving from you. Uh, <laughs> is the, you know, I think the talent managers make their bread and butter. It's a perception of su- success, and it's not actual success. Actual success for us is staying in business. Yeah. And you know, that kind of perceived success uh, is what a lot of the mini majors were built on and then went out of business. So I, I think it's crucial for us to always think about this as a business. It is. It's a film business. Yeah, That's but I think is. what's also changed, sorry to disagree, is that brand, you talk about brand and Ed, you've got your own individual brand. I think companies need to have brands that are B2C and not B2B. But I mean, they, they, they need to be business to consumer and not business to business. Right. And, it's, and, and we've been living in a, a world of silos where you have production, distribution, exhibition. And not, in, in some of these uh, Hollywood companies, still the, the, the departments don't even talk to each other between home and theatrical. It's quite astonishing. And I think we've got to have a completely new way of thinking about no, yeah. how we communicate and market brands. I mean, for instance, at Curzon, we, we don't have the Netflix model, which is purely a, a, a video-on-demand model, which, you know, they have 50,000 movies. We have curated 300 movies that we have on a transactional basis so that people who know the Curzon brand can, can spend you know, $15 on a, on a cinema ticket, they spend $15, the same price, on transacting one of our movies off our home cinema service. And that, I think, is the way that we need to go going forward, is yeah. marking to the consumer. No, you're absolutely right, because if we talk about the future, I mean, we've been, we think that exactly the same way, and that's why, if you go to the VOD platform, there's an IFC folder, and there's a Sundance folder, and, you know, we... We are so lucky that we've got the benefit of not having, not only having cable channels, one Sundance channel is distributed globally, but also having a film festival headed by Robert Redford, that when you say Sundance, it means prestige independent cinema. So, you know, we've been thinking along those lines. But here, I, I want to stop you, because I do think you have incredible brands, but you just said, you started out by saying that you're doing, what, in the last five years, 600 movies? Well, we've cut it way back. Well, and, and I would say that absolutely all of us should cut way back yeah. and curate in service of protecting yep. that brand. Absolutely Because we're right. going to shoot ourselves in the foot. Yeah, well, the one was called Festival Direct. It wasn't really, it didn't have a brand, but we just saw so many great movies at film festivals that were going without distribution. That's why we created, created that label. It didn't say IFC's Festival Direct or Sundance's. It was just called Festival Direct. And it worked initially, but going back to your question, is VOD, you know, the VOD landscape is so crowded right now. When we first got into it, there were, you know, 60 movies available. Now there are over, well over a thousand yeah. on the cable VOD platform. So brands are really important, you know, what Philip's saying. So it's. So, so we all have to adjust our filters a little bit, Winnie. Uh, I think for you, the situation is even more difficult since you can't just focus on one territory, but you're the international yeah, well, sales yeah. agent. You have to, it's quite you have challenging. To it's 192 countries out, outside. Exactly. I mean, and altogether. 129 but I think situations. In extending to what we've been talking mm-hmm. about, just like the branding, I think in that, to that regard, Fortissimo has been building itself as a for top tier supporter of first filmmakers around the world, award-winning films, critically acclaimed, but yet also commercially viable. And to that degree, I think we have been trying to maintain that brand and that direction and that identity in, in a very, very crowded space over the past 10 years. It's extremely crowded. But that's how we managed to get that deal also with Netflix, because we believe that we believe that the consumers, as much as we all agree on this stage, that the consumer should be able to decide and see the films that they want to see in the medium, in the format that they want to see, and which is not accessible, especially for some of the older titles now. And even for the titles like what Philip just mentioned in the Curzon, in the public cinema, they, because they have that reach to the 26 million audience out there at their home, 
I mean, a lot of them, they are not living in London, but yet they can have access to that particular film at the same time while the Londoners are walking around in Curzon Cinema straight into the cinema. So I think I, we believe very much that every film needs a particular strategy to get the best reach to the audience. And whether it's, it's traditional, that comes with a price ticket, that comes with a budget, that comes with a very strong promotion plan. Can you afford to spend that? Some do, some don't. Some producers can, I don't care, I want my movie out there and I'm willing to spend 500,000, I'm willing to spend three million and I'll put up the PNA myself because I want the film to be seen in New York, in LA, in all the main key territories, in the key cities in the USA, in this particular case. And some producers are like, sorry, I really can't afford, I have to get my investors money back. And then, like what I did, I have to find the most creative way to get the film seen by a large audience as possible. So we are a strong believer, but it comp- applies to the US, Canada, or the rest of the world that can see that as well and find the right treatment, the right tailor distribution for that particular film. And in our case, we get to see the world very clearly. UK, with Philip's approach, is one of the first distributor, one of the first countries that's kind of like trying that model. In France, they can't do it yet. There are governmental regulations. Korea never had a DVD market. They're jumping straight from theatrical to the VOD. Everything is on high-speed internet. So every territory around the world, each and each, they're seeing the models that IFC and Magnus has created over the five, seven years, and see it's working. It's successful. Margin call, five million on theatrical, five million on on VOD. Huge success. Say again? Less on VOD. Well, pretty, pretty good. So it's an amazing. Listen, what I love about what we're talking about is margin call is sort of the beacon that Hollywood's like, oh my God, margin call. But Jonathan has been doing this for a very long time. Producers are very happy with the results. Magnolia's been doing this for a very long time. I would say that we're five years into this process, and only now are we really talking about this in a way that could affect the world. You know, and they're slow. I mean, they and UK again is probably one of the first territories to approach this. VOD day and date release uh, structure. So I, we see some changes there slowly, and they and I ha- must say, North America, especially USA, is very very advanced in terms of the internet viewing, in terms of being entrepreneurial and trying to find the right way, the best way to monetize the film distribution. Right. So, but with your- can I just interrupt and ask Philip? So. It is, has anyone approached you as an exhibitor and said, I want to do the same thing in the UK? And you as an exhibitor, what would you say if somebody else came to you with that? You mean as a distributor? No, but if somebody came to, and if another distributor came to you and said, I want to do... Yeah, we, we're working already with, uh, you know, uh, Studio Canal, Lionsgate... Uh, all the, you know, do you charge everyone apart from you, the Hollywood studios yeah. are dealing with us now on, 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 on this model. And do you charge them for it? Do you not charge them for it? Because the mar- pay everybody pay talks about pay margin pay call, it's, but it's, it's, you, they, they, they bought that gross. They four-walled all those theaters. It's not like they made $5 million. The theater owners made $5 million. So there's a real, you know, it is funny how that's reported. Yeah, but, I think, but I think, you know, what's amazing is, like, the, 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 the boss of Cinema, there's a thousand screens in the UK, came to see me uh, last month month and basically said you know try to say look you're destroying the business you're destroying the business I said well how am I destroying the business I said if 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 I'm right let's just hypothesize you know hypothesize for a moment that I'm right and that windows are going to disappear and the consumer you're going to in my estimation you're going to lose a third of your 25 million cinema emissions a year so I said you should be embracing this. You should be having your own video on demand platform and embracing this. But there, there's, a lot of these companies are stuck so much in old thinking. And everyone's afraid of change. I understand that. But we, I, I don't want to keep repeating this. And we, we can't make the same mistakes that the music industry made. Right. Otherwise, we'd, we'd be dead. I, I, I sort of see where this argument's going. And, and it, I think we all agree that making films available to consumers when they want to consume them makes the absolute most sense. Uh, you know, I always joke that the U.S. is not Iceland. You can own Iceland with two, two prints, but six prints is maximum penetration. In the U.S., you know, it takes 2,300 prints to own it in the traditional sense, and I can't afford to do that well, every time out. Um, so, one time would be nice, right? Yeah, one time would be great. I could sit back and retire after my big fat Greek wedding. Uh, but so, but what I want to somebody say, else, was, somebody else could. And so, and what you're doing is, is I think enhancing that that uh, 
this model because you're curating films that deserve to be. Right. You know, you're exponentially creating more audience by making it more available. Um, I would argue that there are certain films in this platform, and Jonathan, you're guilty of distributing them, as have I been, formerly at Magnolia, that I think dis, uh, that abuse that $10 price point, that very high price point where somebody dips into a Boy, pre are you going to tell my filmmakers that? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not a big fan of About Cherry, but it made a huge amount of money. It's a good idea. You know what, Tom? I think that's really unfair because you didn't like the movie. It shouldn't no, be but, there. I, but what I'm saying is, I would the argue... The movie, Jesse, well, he's referring to Stephen Elliott, who I think's here, and if Stephen's in but the let's audience, be honest, you can let's talk be honest. about what, we're, it. We're, we're, so you are well, fighting, and you're, consu- you're going to confuse the consumer right now. Now, the thing is, Tom, Tom being Tom. I, I want to make a point that we, we have a very grand opportunity to access a price point that is extremely high. It's a $10 price point that's available to consumers before it's in theaters. And it's competing against studio product on the same platform at $4. I personally want to make sure that that $10 price point has repeat customers so that we can continue doing this. That's my goal. And that's why About Cherry has been in the top 10 on VOD for, you know, if it was, if it was not deserving it wouldn't continue to remain there well, maybe you didn't like it tom but well you, but you but know. also i mean listen we both know the game that we're playing i mean it was called cherry you retitled it about that's cherry not, and that's not why people are buying it i, I mean no no I, I i know but i'm just saying like <laughs> i would say what so you it would was I, bachelorette uh, but then you recut it <laughs> because the filmmaker wanted to, we wanted to. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, Tom, <laughs> just, just just to get that a little bit on the ground again. Do you when when you <laughs> basically when you when you acquire films, do you kind of ask the same questions as any other distributor, or what is your? I mean, you approach different markets, so so you're looking for other films for different well, films we, that listen, really cater that market. We are we are one label, so you know, I, I we at Magnolia had two labels. You have three labels. Uh, I I believe that I can build a label where we can do documentaries, that we can do genre films, that we can do crossover art films, or you could qualify the broken studio to theatrical that uh, studio size theatrical that doesn't work on 2,000 plus prints. And I believe that we can all do it in radius. But each of those films are completely different in how they function. You know, we launched Bachelorette on 47 prints this weekend. Solomon Kane is a film that we've also launched on VOD. It's doing very well, but it's a completely different audience. I think it's a very small, midnight genre audience uh, that would probably only work in about 15 markets. So that's a much smaller theatrical release for me. Um, and those are the, the variations within each film that we will use to approach the model. The other part that we're not talking about is I'm so fascinated by the fact that each provider, each VOD provider, which, yes, is the single worst name. Thank you for changing that. Um, it sounds like an STD. Um, it, but, uh, you know, I think that's why people sort of in some way on Batch Right glommed on to is number one on iTunes. Like iTunes is, is sort of replacing the idea of what on demand is because it's a sexy name and I believe that that's also part of our job is changing the perception of what VOD sounds like what it is etc um, at um, given the experience you made with your with your past films with the last films um, do you think that there is a potential beyond a certain budget I think uh, for Geo Family Christmas was about $100,000 if I'm not wrong a little bit, budget? Uh, more than that. I mean, what, what yep. we've done is sort of in looking at the, the numbers that, that, you know, that we know we can make on iTunes and VOD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and given what, you know, the, the, the great looking films you could make with these new digital cameras, we sort of do something where our cast and crew, for the most part, work for free. We collectively own the film. We treat it more like an indie rock band. Uh, you know, you're going to. We collectively decide to go at this thing, uh, not get paid, and in success, if the album breaks through on the charts, we're all going to make a nice chunk of change. And the good thing is, you know, in New York, there's plenty of very talented folks who are tired of the kind of jobs that we we tend to do with the studios, and uh, I'm able to get these folks to jump in with me. So. By keeping those, bu- and again, you know, the, the, it isn't qu- really a realistic number given that everyone's working for free. It's a lot of deferred costs, and, and, and they own the film. But um, you know, the great thing that's happened in the last three years and the last three films is uh, we started to make money as filmmakers. You know, usually when you make an indie film, you make a movie for three million dollars, you get your, you know, your nothing fee, 
and mm -hmm. you get the promise of some participation when that movie makes money. I'm, I'm sure every distributor is glad to hear that, that it goes straight to you. But uh, do, do you consider that as a, as a business model for, for particular young, young filmmakers who maybe for, made their first film now or are about to make their first film uh, a way to step into that? Uh, I think absolutely. Into, it's, a, it's the most exciting time if you're a kid coming out of film school right now. You can go pick up a Canon 5D for $3,000. I mean, back when we were making McMullen, you had to find a 16-millimeter camera. We had to find recan film stock. Then you couldn't afford to get the film out of the lab because you couldn't afford to get it you know, processed. Uh, you then had to try and find uh, you know, uh, an old steam bag to cut the film. I mean, it was impossible to get it done. Now these kids can go buy that camera, shoot it, cut it on their, uh, on their laptop on Final Cut, uh, and there's no reason, I mean, depending on the kind of films you want to make. You know, I, mean, I make small, talky comedy dramas, people sitting around kitchens and bullshitting. You know, if you want to make an action film, uh, this is not the model for you. Um, so depending on what you, you know, the kind, of, the kind of films you want to make, it is a really exciting time. And the other thing is, you know, talking about a brand and building that, you know, uh, for the cost of, you know, a lot of the big time film schools. You could say, all right, let's say my, over the course of four years, it's going to cost my parents $120,000. Let me make five films at $25,000 a pop. And over the course of five years, you now have slowly, you know, if you're any good, maybe built an audience so that by the time your sixth film comes out, again, the, you know, the, the indie rock analogy, you have put out your three albums, you toured all over and like the Black Keys, Boom, your time has arrived on the sixth album. <laughs> that is what is available to no, young kids now. Yeah, Eddie, we work with this guy, Joe Swanberg, and that's exactly what Joe has done, and that whole mumblecore group. And now the, you know, the Duplass guys are making movies in Hollywood, and Lynn Shelton, who yep. Dom and I both distribute. That's, the, you know, that's exactly what that whole group did. And Joe just keeps making them and making them, and he gets better and better every time. And he had no... Training, at least it sure didn't look like it in this first couple of years. The thing is, I remember in the early 90s, you know, a big time success for an indie film, you know, if you got picked up for distribution like Link Letter Slacker, I, I think that did like maybe 800000 or a million dollars. That was considered huge. And then, you know, it's mid, still huge, right? Yeah, well, then mid to late 90s, if you did those kind of numbers, forget about it. You know, so our, our perception of what success was for a good 10 years during the, you know, that, that, those golden years was a little warped, and now it's kind of returned back to that. And I, you know, I keep trying to tell like young filmmakers, don't look for the overnight success and try and become a multimillionaire. Like, if that's the game plan, uh, you know, <laughs> good luck to you. But you should have. But do you do you do you develop your films, you know, towards VOD, towards a a uh, digital or online release strategy? Well, do you what? Do you develop your film, to design your Absolutely film? Absolutely not. No say filmmaker, they should, they should. I don't think any filmmaker wants their film to be seen on a laptop. But, uh, I, you know, in the same way that no musician wants someone to listen to their music on an MP3 file through a tiny little bug. You know, you want someone to listen to that on vinyl through a great system. But, you know, it isn't a perfect world. And, you know, we're trying to stay in business. So if that's where they are and that's where they want yeah. to consume, who am I to argue with you. I just want your bucks. I, 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 just to add to that, <laughs> I, think, I think what listening to Ed has really made me, uh, r r remind me now in terms of our marketing and publicity and what's available through using technology. I mean, the idea of flying, you know, people over first class from Los Angeles to come and do a premiere and stay in a five-star hotel and run ex up expenses, which is a part of p &A. All of that, as far as we're concerned, is history. We try, we try to engage with the talent right from the pre-production stage, we pre bought a film. We, we, you know, we, 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 we get as much talent as possible to come into our cinemas, they do a Q&A, we'll post a Q&A on, on YouTube. We get paid for that by the amount of hits we get from marketing, uh, from advertisers. It's all a very positive, you know, uh, cycle of not having to spend huge amounts of money to promote movies in a very clever way. And I think the talent on the movie have a huge part to play in that in the future. I think the talent, and Ed is the prime example, is the brand that puts the staple of, I own this movie, I approve of it, you like me, we can do business. Okay, great. I think it's can time to add we... one point. Uh, Sorry, of course. I, I wanted to say that you know nobody. We've been talking about how great BOD is, but Jonathan made a really fantastic point that it is an abyss. It's an absolute abyss. It's not pixie dust just because you got up onto a platform. 
and that you're up on iTunes or you're up on Comcast, you're up on DirecTV, means that you've made it. You still actually have to work as a distributor. And I think, and this comes back to your earlier question, and this is what fascinates me, is you have to treat every provider much the same way that you would treat three different theaters on the same block in New York. They're all very different. They all uh, you know, showcase their posters very differently. And so until you actually do that homework and you start to see uh, you know, some of the fruits of, well, if we did it this way, if we did it this way. And you know, the first time that I saw uh, a fantastic promotion that Ed did with Time Warner, uh, somebody may have done it before, but I had never thought of it, and maybe you guys came up with it, was about promoting Nice Guy Johnny on the bills that you send to consumers. It's a very old-fashioned idea, but I was like, I didn't know that was available. Why aren't we doing that at Magnolia? So I, I just feel like until you do that legwork and the homework uh, as a traditional distributor Tom, does. You, Tom, you obviously have never looked at a cable bill before. Well, because I, my wife called. paid the Time Warner cable bill, so I never saw it, but this time I saw it. I was like, nice guy, Johnny's that on is the bill. Oh, my bill God. Stuffer, and that's been around for... I'm sorry, Ed, you know, since I've been in the business 30 years and they're trying to get the Islanders to watch uh, on cable vision. So it's, it's been... But to do it yeah, with okay. an independent film, yeah. I mean, I, that to me was Hollywood genius. Studios would buy them, and yeah, it's... I think Brothers McMullen I got one for, too. Okay. It, uh, Please, I, think, I think we have a lot, of, a lot of questions from the audience at this point. Yes. Uh, well, we have somebody going around with a, with a microphone. Let's start right in front here. Um, Don Rabinovich from uh, an amalgam of all of what you've said today, a new group uh, called Quadflix, where we've taken the quad cinema and we've tried to uh, grow the brand through um, what used to be called four walling. Uh, I know Jonathan knows about it. And um, my mentor is Elliot Canbar, who's going to be 80 years old, who hopefully has turned over the baton or the microphone to me. And branding and uh, curating and starting with brick and mortar, which is not a burden, um, Phil. I mean, I'm so happy that we've got brick and mortar on 15th Street, uh, uh, Fifth Avenue and 13th Street because in nine months we've gotten 250 uh, independent films of the kind that Ed's made and that you all enjoy. Fortissimo included, and fortunately we were able to select only 60 out of the 250, and uh, in Friday's New York Times, just an example of the release of uh, Las Acacias, and uh, from getting the uh, buzz and the publicity and the critical reviews, now we're going to put it on all of the digital platforms and people will know what to look for because uh, we're, we're, we're going to drive them to that spot. So uh, branding and uh, cooperation and strategic uh, alliances is what it's all about. And resistance to change uh, is going to leave a lot of people uh, in the dust. Yeah, for, for, uh, for an exhibitor, another exhibitor to say that's really important and it's really critical because in New York, aside from us and Landmark, you know, it's, yeah, we, we, I respect, it's I respect what you're doing. Uh, we have a brand. You've got a lot more money. I've only been at this nine months, but I hope the partner. I know you guys. I thought I thought it was brilliant. When I hope to partner with Ed Burns and John Sloss and take the yeah, film yeah, off to the making, next level. You're making a big mistake if you're partnering with John Sloss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I really enjoyed everything that everybody said. It all is right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Hello. Hi, David Bordwell, <clears throat> David Bordwell, University David. of Wisconsin. Uh, just a quick question. Nobody mentioned D DVD. Uh, with th DVD well, flattening and dying, is it over with? No, is there absolutely a not. I, indie film on DVD. Uh, I spent seven and a half years at Magnolia. The single most profitable division in that company is yeah. the DVD label. Yeah. And for and, us this year, our DVD numbers are the best they've ever been. About Cherry's going to be awesome on DVD. About Cherry's going to be awesome. <laughs> absolutely, Tom. You're going to want to own it. Uh, and for but it good is reason. going. It, it, there is a drop off in the in the UK. We're da nationally, we're down ten percent year on year. Um, but we're, we're flat as a company. Yeah, it's, it's really it's curious because we were seeing a trend down, and then we've seen a trend up in the past couple of years. And we've got a great deal with Criterion where they do about a dozen of our titles a year. It's very unique, um, and they're you know they've always done well. But all of our DVDs are doing you know the great thing about VOD and, and we didn't talk about it is. You know, we have a theater. It hasn't cannibalized our, our grosses at our theater at all. If anything, 
you know, I, I, if anything, if the movie's good, it, it uh, creates word of mouth, and I think yeah, it I've helps got, grow the box. I've opened four theaters this, this year. We're going to open another five next year. I mean, we want to get up to, you know, a lot more. Right. Okay. Um, hi. Um, my name is Mario Tusi. I'm a producer, and I have two questions, one for Philip and one for Winnie, and I'd like Ed to sort of try to keep this honest. Um, uh, for Philip, quickly, just you talked about uh, n- windows and, and disappearing windows, but you talked about Netflix as part of the model. So does your home cinema, uh, do you take it off your home cinema platform once you sell to Netflix? No, not, not have it's completely it? a different... Um, Netflix is what they call SVOD, which is subscription-based only. Our, our model is a TVOD or transactional video on demand, so it's pay-per-view. So they don't conflict, it's different windows. So they run at the same time. And, so they, and they run in parallel as well, yes. Okay, great, thanks. And then, so the question for Winnie is, uh, we've talked about grosses in VOD. What I'd like to know is sort of look under the hood and talk about margins as far as what, the, what it means for the producer. Uh, came up when we were talking about theatrical versus not, and sort of what Ed's telling us sort of gives us, uh, you know, why theatrical may be meaningful to distributors. Uh, is it meaningful to producers? because of the margins that they're getting based on how it performs uh, gross in a, in a box office theatrically versus how it would work at the home cinema a scenario with VOD. Just trying to get your question right. Um, I think every, as Ed mentioned earlier, every filmmaker, when they start making a film, they want the film to be seen on the larger screen and, and yet at the same time to as many people as possible. So the expenses you make this investment you make towards a film in making it and then eventually using it to get the film out there in the PA and in marketing expenses is a, an additional cost that every producer should consider and should think about. And whether that's going to be part of a distributor who comes on board and spends it, whether it's Jonathan at IFC, they will be using a traditional release pattern, or it's going to be Magnet, or I'm sorry, it's going to be Radius <laughs> spending it, or Philip at Curzon. It's Every distributor has a budget to it, but ultimately it's, it's a decision between producer and a distributor coming on board, like, what do we okay. want? Yeah, can I just, uh, because we've, been to, we've done 500 movies, and we had worn a production hat before that, and the worst thing when you're a producer or a financier is selling your movie, like Eddie said, you sell it, and that's it, you don't see money back. Uh, we got into, we got into, you know, the industry was broken, especially a specialized industry, because studios got into it, they spent, like it was a studio movie, but they used studio economics for indie films and it didn't work. So what's critical about, I think, and, and Tom knows this, is you have to manage the P&A. For the 500 movies we've released in this manner, one way or the other, we probably send participation backs, checks back for 70 to 80 percent of the movies. Now you can say, well, some movies you didn't pay advances for. That's true. Some we paid a lot of money for. It you know it depends on the success. But the great thing about this model is you don't have to spend the kind of P&A that you know from the mid 90s through the mid 2000s companies were spending and nobody was seeing any money. And the beauty of that batting average, this is my favorite part about all this, is that we as distributors can stop thinking thinking about films as it relates to our wallets. You know, th- films that we right. truly want to support and take risks with. Uh, that goes also to the MG, the minimum guarantee. I, I would love to as a distributor to get away from always having to put up a minimum guarantee and get into business with the producer early on a revenue yeah. share basis. That's the other thing that's I think changed and I know this is going to be one of the things that maybe we're going to talk about, but the economics of this whole business have changed, and the economics of production have changed, and the studios, I think, are still trying to figure, to really figure it out, and they can't. And, you know, they, uh, you know, the, I, the only place I think they can go are the big 3D, you know, extravaganzas that'll get people into these megaplex plexes because they don't know how not to spend money. They'd, I'm not saying they don't know how to spend it well, but they don't know now, they don't know how not to spend it. They can't help themselves. So. Okay. You do, sorry, j- sorry, just one okay. thing in between. Do you think that the, uh, the production budgets will get under pressure through our current production budgets? Yeah, I, I, I was talking to this really the guy who find or who produced gold um, guy who produced my big fat Greek wedding. Paul Brooks, he'll tell you. He said the whole th- he came to us with this movie ATM. Granted, it started with an A, but it's a really good genre title, and it did. Yes. Uh, it did a lot of it. 
did unbelievable business on VOD. When I say unbelievable, you know, several million dollars just on VOD. And and Paul came to us with that because he was like, people spend too much on P&A, we're spending too much on producing movies. He said, none of the economics makes sense. And every all my friends in the studio business can't figure out what, you know, what we're doing. And that, and, you know, we all have had the benefit of saying it's broken, it doesn't work, and we've gone back to the independent, to the specialized business, where it was probably 20, 30 years ago. So, so it's really curious. For, for the time being, we're all glad to be part of the independent part of it. We're all glad just to uh, be here, I think. Industry. Are we? Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> okay, please. Hi, how are you? My name is Joanna Vargas, MTIP, and partnering with Quadflix. Um, we're actually focusing right now on a niche market, which is Latino, Hispanic market for distribution. Being that you're all successful in the, your various facets, what would be a suggestion to us, being that we're you know, about to venture into this huge market that really doesn't have the distribution capacity right now um, or available to them? May I add a couple of things to that? And actually that market is uh, 50 million plus in the United States. It's the larger consumer, consumers, uh, demographically speaking, of entertainment in the United States. And then that demographic automatically translates to the rest of Latin America. So whatever sells in... The United States in that market is well, huge success. In the, the other part about that audience, it's also, I think, per capita, one of the more engaged online than any other demo. Uh, so I'm totally fascinated by that market. I think we've all worked at companies uh, who have tried to crack that theatrically. I think Lions did, Lions gets done a pretty good job. You guys did a fantastic job with Itu Mama Tambien. Uh, I don't think people are doing enough on the distribution side. And I think it comes back to actually producing enough quality films to be able to go out and experiment. Uh, you know, we, I think we never did that well at Magnolia, but what we did do well are a lot of urban films. And we found that uh, smaller, no-budget urban films uh, that we could support would be some of our biggest earners on DVD in Walmart compared to movies starring Robert De Niro. And so I think it's an incredibly viable market, but unfortunately, you know, we're all excluding Winnie, white men. And, I, I, you know, it's, I mean, that's, Tom, that should give you some yourself. indication of what, what I think is possibly wrong with that equation. You know? Yeah, but, but, you know, I would say the cable industry think it's their most, you know, probably one of the most important segments of their marketplace. And they come to us on a monthly basis asking for Latino titles. And, uh, you know, I could, they do it all the time. If somebody could crack that nut... The one caveat here is they've got to, and Tom said that, they've got to be good movies. And, you know, it, it can't just be anything because there's so much available on cable for that marketplace. But in terms of good quality movies, they, you know, that's an industry that's, that's hungry for them. And they come all the time. So you can come up with great movies. You know, we sell a lot to HBO because they, you know, they love those movies. They love that market. So... Okay, we have time for one more yes. question um, over there. Continue with the Latino market. I'm uh, Lilia Shams, a producer from Mexico. And well, so what happened with the role of agents in, in a market as Latino market or overall when producers want to go through that platform as uh, VODs or searching new ways of marketing or movies? Is it for me? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, overall, I, I know you're I'm okay. I, I represent the yes. rest of the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we work very close with the producers to explain to them what they can expect when they, when they come get, out, get to us early enough in the production side. We work with the producer what to expect when the film is finished and how we want to approach it to each and every distributor around the world. So we manage the expectations and see, we want to see the finished film and then according to the film, which distributor and which strategy would be appropriate. So it really depends on, ultimately, if the film is going to be screened here at TIFF, for example, and, and the response is well, and it depends on the distributor, whether it's Tom comes aboard and Jonathan both like, hey, well, we love it, and we have this idea. And just what Ed earlier pointed out is like, what's the upside and what are you going to achieve? So what our job is to work with the producers and to explain to them and manage the expectations of what the film can be with which distributor and that for each and every territory. So again, what Ed mentioned earlier, it could be a very standard distribution model where you have a very modest or no advance and what comes to what the no p &A or a very big p &A, and ultimately you may not see anything, but it comes to the regular cinemas and then eventually on a DVD and then a TV, um, pay TV and a VOD 
platforms, but then or it can go to a day and day release platform. So it really depends on how you work closely with the producer and manage to them what's your film, what's its value, what's its audience ultimately. Like um, producing a movie doesn't mean sales agents will will buy will acquire it. So, what happened like in the in the music industry that bands had how go straight to to all these platforms? Like, what can be for in, independent filmmakers? Can independent producers and filmmakers can jump that that bridge? It's, it's really hard. You know, I'm, it's very very hard for an individu individual filmmaker, producer, even a very small one to go to a company like Comcast and say, take my movie or go to an iTunes and say, take my movie. It's just very, very hard. There's still companies like ours in between that they would prefer to deal with. Aggregate, there are aggregators out there, but I mean, if you can imagine if you're on the other end of it, it sounds, it's unfair. It's not unfair. When you, I mean, I don't know how many movies are here, but there are four or 500 movies here Think about all the movies that aren't here, that are, don't get distribution. If all of those filmmakers were going to go to the quote-unquote independent person at iTunes, maybe we should send them to Matt, all of them, but if they were supposed to go to you him... You can watch them two at one time. Yes, <laughs> it, it, it's impossible. And then to negotiate all those deals contractually, it becomes very, very expensive. So you have to... And but, it's not a perfect system. But, but, you, you have to find, uh, at least in the States, you have to find... An aggregator. No, but I think what you're also saying is, is there a way of releasing your film without the involvement of people like ourselves? And the answer right. is and yes. I'm, and the music industry are doing that very well. And YouTube, you should go. Yeah, and I, w I would say it's no in the States. I really disagree with that. I mean, you can. No one is going to see it. You're not going to make any money. And it'll cost you money to get to those platforms. I, I would argue in the music industry, though, it clearly has happened. Uh, and you know, I think in the film industry, Ed is an example of this. Louis C.K. is also a fantastic example. Clearly a different animal. But being able to distribute his films directly for a film that not everybody was totally on board to buy at Sundance when it initially premiered. So he went and did it himself. I feel like approaching the industry that same way on a smaller scale and you understanding expectations of what you have to do to get that audience to follow you, I think it's totally possible. Yeah, I agree. I think you just have to manage the expectations. Like these bands who are able to go through TuneCore and get their, get their music out there. I mean, their numbers are tiny. And back to the sort of, you know, taking it on the road and going to play in front of 15 people in some bar and hoping to sell two or three CDs, you know, that young filmmaker has to do whatever the equivalent of that is in our business. And that means hitting every film festival yeah. and showing up and shaking hands and getting emails and trying to build that fan base. But it is, you know, the, there's no, that's not going to be an overnight success. It goes back to that thing that... You know, it's going to take a couple of years and a right. couple of films if you're lucky. And to that point, if you're a filmmaker, I would say you should be making films. You shouldn't be distributing films because if you're taking that movie on the road, it's different if you're a musician. You continually are playing. You're continually doing your craft. If you're a filmmaker and you're distributing it. You're not a filmmaker. You're a distributor. And I, there's Bill Plimpton does this all the time, and it frustrates the hell out of me about Bill, but I think he feels it's the only way he can do it. He's a great animator. But when he turns into a distributor, he stops animating. And so he, you know, he has a stop and start process for a year. And when you're a producer, and I've financed filmmakers that have been like that, it drives you nuts. You're only going to get better at your craft if you keep making movies. I'm sure we could continue for at least one more hour easily, but uh, unfortunately we have well, to... Well, Tom keeps throwing the <laughs> softballs up there, yes, exactly. well. <laughs> It's very entertaining. Well, thank you very much for, for taking the time out of your busy uh, Toronto schedule. Thanks for joining us this afternoon.